Lord, for just meeting us today. Lord, meeting us every day, fresh and anew. And Lord, just the words beautiful and powerful and wonderful. Lord, uh, just rings through our hearts. And Lord, we thank you for this time. In your name, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Isn't it great to be here this morning? Hey, I love, the, I love when we get to this time of the year, we have this sort of color of sort of dark greys come out. And uh, everyone sort of, oh, thank you. Everyone sort of, you know, getting their head around how to keep warm in winter. I was out the front of the church this morning, a few people wandering in, and I was standing there and I was smelling the air, and I closed my eyes for a moment, and I thought, Quilpie, kind of muller. Took me straight back there where we were on holidays a couple of years ago. Love the cool weather. But it's warm in here, it's warm in the house of God. It's warm in relationship when we come together, and that's what we're about today, and that's what we've been singing about, and it's been great to hear those words. It's just like a choir to me. This morning I'm standing there, and the noise is just bashing through on me, and I'm thinking, wow, this must be like in heaven, you know, when when the choruses of thousands of nations are singing together and uh, praising God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Our God reigns. Well, folks, we've been doing some interesting things in the last couple of weeks, been praying and doing all sorts of stuff. And uh, be meeting together, I've been waiting to get feedback now about some of the things that God has brought to mind in those prayer times. So don't be shy about that. But I was praying about this during the week, and um, and it came to me that what we're actually doing now is we're actually while we're going. That's the next part of our journey is while we're going, while we're going and being purposeful. And we're going to look at those scripture verses in a moment, and uh, we're going to look about why the title of the of the message is that for today. And there's a couple of things I want you to do today. One of them is that when you hear what God is saying to your heart, please respond to that. If you need to bow your head in prayer and say, Lord, I just need to do business with you, please do that. If you have have an inspiration from God, write it down and come and see me later. If you have a word, let me know about it. Because I believe God is moving when we open his word and we engage in him. We've heard some wonderful, we've worshipped some wonderful s- in song this, this morning. We've worshipped at the table. Now we're worshipping his word. We've worshipped in prayer. And it's about coming into the presence of God as a corporate body, as his church. That's what happens. When we come together as his church, things happen. And that's when we look at God's word today, what it says about that. I might just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you go the extra. Lord, you are, Lord, 110%. Lord, there's no way to describe you, Lord. Words cannot describe you. Father, what you do in our lives, what you've done in our lives, Lord, what you're going to do in our lives, Lord, we look forward to that. Father, we pray that as we open your word today, Lord, let it resonate through us. Lord, let us just hear what you've got to say. Holy Spirit, speak to us in words that cannot be uttered. Let us hear from you today. Oh, Father, we thank you that when Jesus gathered his disciples together, he gathered them with a purpose. There was an intention there that was about setting them up for the future. And Lord, we know that's what you want to do with us. Lord, you want to give us a glimpse into the future. Lord, help us, Lord, to understand what it means to be purposeful for you in your name. And Father, I pray as always, the words I pray, Lord, and Lord, the words I speak, Lord, are your words, not mine. In your name, amen. I don't know how you go about it, but if you've ever played in a club sport, there's a dressing shed speech. And uh, it's, it's one of those things that happens if you've been in a team sport and it can happen, it doesn't have to be in the dressing shed, we call the dressing shed speech, in America they call the locker room speech, it's where the coach gets the team together. And when he gets the team together, what happens is, is that he, he starts to tell them, he gives them a little grain of truth, he gives them something to take out onto the field, into the battle if you want to use those words, he, he, t- he em- empowers the not so strong members of the team and he affirms the strong members of the team. And so as one they rise and they go out through the doors into the playing field. Some powerful words to be spoken in those times. It's about bringing the team together. It's about remembering your training, a a few glimpses of that. But it's usually a succinct statement. It's usually something that comes together at that point in time. That's what God does with us when we open his word. That's what Jesus did with his disciples. Jesus had an opportunity to do this. Oh, sorry, that was Kevy in a better time when he's having a locker room speech with the state of origin side. And it's about bringing the team together and psyching them up, if you want to use those words. It's not really a false psyching. It's just an affirmation. It's not about building up something big and then everything falls away. It's about bringing these things together. And Jesus, he had a, a, a dressing shed speech for the disciples. I wonder if you've recognized this dressing shed speech that he gave them. 
In the, ele the eleven disciples went to the Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when he saw them, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus said to them, All authority, all authority is given to you on heaven and earth. It's been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. What a locker room speech. What a great thing to give the disciples before he ascended. He said, this is what your role is, disciples. This is what I want you to do. This is the game plan. Go for it. While you are going, because that's what it means for you at the start of that, therefore go, in the Greek it means while you are going. Not just go and do something, but while you're going, do these things. When you're in participating in life, do this. And so the locker room speech or the dressing shed speech is given out. And uh, inspired, off they went. Straight up to the room to pray. As Jesus had instructed them, we read at the back of Luke and the back of John. Jesus had uh, several times he spoke to the disciples. But I just love the idea of that whole understanding of what it means to be in his presence and to listen to what he's saying to your heart. There's a couple of things that have come up today that I want to talk to you about in that regard, about that locker room speech and um, how he spoke to his disciples. In John 15, we read about Jesus uh, preparing his disciples. It's called the farewell discourse. It starts in John 14, goes us through to John 17. We all know that John 14 says, you know, you know the place where I'm going, that one, and I am the way, the truth, the life, and those things. And uh, he, he goes through and he sets them up. He gives them something to look at, something to point on to, something to hold on to. And it, it comes to John 15, verses 1 to 3. And it's, an, it's the I am, it's an I am. And he says, I am the true vine. You know, there's something different about this. When Jesus says, I am, the I am statements in previous places in Scripture, he's talking about bringing people to him, to believe in him, to give their lives to him. This I am is talking about those who are already in Christ. So when he says, I am the vine, my father is the gardener, he's talking to the disciples in front of him, he's talking to us. He's saying to believers in Jesus Christ, this is a message for you. This is for you to contemplate, this is for you to meditate upon, this is for you to get revelation from. And when we understand that, when we read that into the context of this piece of scripture, it takes on a different meaning. Let's just read the first couple of verses. Jesus said, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. So that it will be even more fruitful. Those first few verses that Jesus says. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. This was an intentional speech, an intentional direction, an intentional word. And it goes to paint the picture about being purposeful. Jesus was purposeful how he did this. And he says these words, and because he says it intentionally, he's saying there's things that you need to pay attention to. This is about your relationship. This is about how you grow. This is how you become part of the church family. This is how you become dynamic in the world. Because that is what I'm calling you to do. You see, when we don't do things intentionally, we do them half-heartedly, we have outcomes like that. When we do things half-heartedly, our outcomes are half-hearted. If you only partly prepare to do a concrete slab and then all of a sudden the, the, the concrete turns up, cement turns up, and you start pouring and think, I haven't got enough boxing, and all of a sudden your boxing spills out because you didn't put enough pegs in it. We need to prepare for things that we do. And we need to do them wholeheartedly. And Jesus wants us to wholeheartedly to understand this about the intention that's going on here. Because when, when we wholeheartedly prepare, we have wholehearted outcomes. And as we go through this passage, there's a, there's a phrase that Jesus uses twice in the New Testament that I've found that I think is so important about being purposeful for him. Now you ask, we have the question then, what is our purpose? I understand, what is your purpose? The Purpose Driven Church that was written a few years ago uh, set up a whole un questioning about that and people were pondering about their purpose, about what it was, where they were in the world, what their significance was. And so when we're trying to be intentional, we need to ask ourselves, well, what is our purpose? What's our intention here? There are significant outcomes when we are purposeful. And I've got a significant outcome there because there's something, the truth I want to get at today. As we dig down through this passage, Jesus has made the, the, the statement to the disciples, to the believers in him, that I am the vine, my father is the gardener. And he's going to do some stuff. He needs to do some stuff. And it's about how that interacts with us today. 
God is purposeful. That's the first thing we need to understand. God is purposeful. Because a gardener doesn't just walk, or perhaps if he was me, <laughs> he goes around with an intention of making sure things are treated. So I don't know if you know Victor Robinson. Victor is now uh, a classified orchid nut. To such an extent now he's got a, a, a greenhouse in the backyard nearly is about that size of half of the church and he's into his orchids and he's down there tending to them and he won prizes at a local show like he's only been doing it for a little while but he's really he's researched it he's looked into it and he knows what orchids need and so then he, he feeds the orchids he's very purposeful and intentional about it and god is purposeful and intentional in our spiritual development every one of us here has experienced god has had God pour into your life something intentional and purposeful. He has looked at you and said, this is what you need. When you respond to him as your Lord and Savior, he's given you hope for the future. And we know this because sometimes he cuts things off that aren't good. He makes us examine ourselves and we get a bit self-conscious. Sometimes we feel judged, but it's about the things that we need to cut off that aren't conducive to good growth. He cuts off, it says in Scripture, and it also says he prunes. This is God being intentional. He doesn't just let us wander around through life. He actually works with us. But we've got to be open to that. We've got to have a soft heart for that. We've got to be realize that's what he's doing. Sometimes when God points something out to us, he needs to prune or cut off. In the Greek, those words are very, very similar. There's only a couple of extra letters in one than the other. They actually mean the same thing. When he does that, how do we respond? And the, the whole point of God's purpose in that is that to bear fruit, which is something special takes place. I wasn't always the gifted orator you see before you. I used to drop a few vowels and make a few sentences um, up and I used to make words up and my, my grammar has never been as perfect as it is now. But God does a work in you. He is purposeful for you. My heart breaks when I find someone who doesn't understand that, who's just missing out. My heart breaks when I have people who have been in churches for a long time and they miss out on this truth that God is working in you. He wants to trim and prune. He wants, he's purposeful in your life. And there's a reason for that. He wants you to bear fruit. And, and when that happens, this special thing that takes place, he is saying, pay attention to me. I actually wrote down in my notes in Biro and I was praying about the message this morning after I put it all together and I asked God, is this really what you want me to say? I'm pretty sure he does. God prompts you today. It was great that Rachel already has put the, the, w the feeler out there. If you need to do business with God today because he's pruning and trimming and cutting and he's making it better and he wants to give help you to bear fruit, if God is prompting you today, say, I don't understand that. I never felt that, Pastor Doug. You, perhaps you need to. I don't want you to go through life thinking, well, I can just fob my way along and just hope for the best, do business with God. So if you b need to bow your head during this message, please do so. I will not for the first time in nearly 10 years say that you're asleep. And I won't go Whoa! like that to wake you up. If you bow your head during this message to do business with God, I just praise God for that because he is doing a work in you. He is purposely engaging in you. You know, if God's going to be intentional, we need to be intentional as well. We read the rest of that passage. If we have a look with me, we're reading from verse 5. Uh, oh sorry, verse 4 says, Remain in me and I'll remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Well, oh, thank goodness for that. I was a bit worried for a moment there. If a man remains in me, I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. There's a whole lot of remains in there, isn't there? Remains, remains, remains. This is about the intentionality that we need to embrace. We need to be intentional in our walk with God. Because it says, if you remain in me. When we're intentional in our relationship with Jesus, then certain things happen. We actually in engage in Jesus. The word remain there is not meant to be passive. 
But when you become a Christian or you become a believer, if you've just prayed the prayer recently, you're praying right now, it's not about whether or not <coughs> it's not about whether or not you've given your life to Jesus, what happens in that life, in that context. It's a challenge issue to us, I suppose, in some regards, not to be passive, not to just go along and float along, but actually look for chances to grow, opportunities to engage God, opportunities to be the vine that has been pruned and showing fruit. The word actually remain in me, the Greek word means to, to be close and settled upon. It means to actually get in close. I always think of this verse and I see a scrum pack on the field. Those guys are really close. And when Jesus is talking about remain in me, he's not just saying just be a Christian. He's saying get in close to me. He's getting close to me. He's talking to the disciples. He's not talking to the people to come to God. He's talking to people who are already walking with God. And he says, you need to get closer. Do you see the significance in this message? It's about being intentional about what we do with God, how we engage with him. He's talking to the disciples. He's saying, disciples, you need to remain in me. You need to get close to me. You need to draw into me. And as we do that, certain things happen. He says, if my word remains in you. It's, and, of course, we understand in 2 Timothy, it talks about what that is. In his word is the teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. Wow. What a great God we have that he wants this to happen in our lives. He wants us to remain in him. He wants us to be intentional about that. He also, when we're intentional, we bear fruit, which is enriched relationship with God. That's what it means. In this context, the fruit means an enriched relationship with God. I always thought that bear fruit means that it's all the people who come to Jesus. But when he's talking to the disciples, he's talking about how your relationship is. He wants you to bear fruit. He wants to let you. He wants you to show your relationship with him. It's about that rich, rich relationship you have. It's about showing that God is there. It's about jettisoning was not of God, and about being intentional in that. Francis Chan said these words. He's a the, the Christian cardiologist. He said, "No, he's not. That's the other guy. This is a different guy. But this, he's a Christian. This fellow, anyway." And he says, God doesn't want any religious duty. He doesn't want a distracted, half-hearted, fine, I'll be, read a chapter, now are you happy, attitude. God wants his word to be a delight to us. So much more that we meditate on it day and night. Intentional is actually participating in the kingdom of God. Reading his word that teaches, rebukes and trains reading his word and then getting revelation from that. It's not about an ideology. It's not about a religion. It's just about a relationship. And that's the most important thing. If we're going to be intentional, that's what it's about. There's a verse 8 at the end of this passage I want to read with you now. And this is the crux of the matter. This is one of the two times that Jesus said it in this way in Scripture. You can find many variations, but these are the two he's getting at. This is the first one. In verse 8, he said, this is, my, this is to my Father's glory. So everything that comes in the trimming and the growing and everything else and the fruit that's bearing is not for us. It's about the glory for fa the Father. This is to my Father's glory. You bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. When you're in God's glory, you're bearing the fruit, you're bearing the, 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 the whole essence of that relationship. And as you grow in God, as he trims and he prunes, your fruit will become more evident. Your relationship becomes deeper. And as you become deeper with God, then you start to do things that he wants you to do in the way that's good for us. And he blesses you for that. He gives you direction. He gives you purpose. It looks different for each person in this room. I'm not putting a wide brush stroke over things. I know that we all do individual, different, uh, di individual times with God. It's about when we personally seek to glorify God, we create a spiritual unity that glorifies him. That is one of the marks. So Jesus is saying when we trim and when, oh boy, I had all sorts of things happening here. When we trim and when we do things and when we go through the experience that we have with God, then there's a hallmark of that, that the closeness is also unity. Have you ever thought of that before? I mean, people say we need to do an activity that brings unity to the church. Can I say this? The Holy Spirit brings unity to the church. If you're fed and come with God and let the Spirit flow, that brings unity. Unity comes from one mind for God. 
And the challenge went out for that one heart in Romans. And the author wrote these words in Romans 15, 5 to 7. He said, may the God, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other, the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then it goes on to verse 7. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise. One of the great opportunities we have when when it's glorifying God, if we strive to glorify God, if we understand this passage, it becomes who we are, both personally and as a church. It becomes who we are and the direction we start to go in. The word glorify in Scripture means to ascribe, honour and magnify. So when we're allowed God to trim us, when we're allowed God to work on us and we feel a bit uncomfortable, we say, yes, Lord, I know this is what's going to happen and I'm going, we bear that fruit of relationship. And when that relationship starts to come together with God, we start to relate to each other better. And we start to take away our preconceived notions. We start to st- take away our prejudice and all we see is one in God. There's a reason for this. The reason for this is found in Matthew. We're going to look at that in a moment. But it's about bringing the glory to God. In Matthew Matthew 5, thir- three, it should, yeah, 13 to 16, this is what it says. You're probably familiar with this verse. It talks about salt and light. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? If no, no, if it, sorry, it's no longer good for anything except be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a gla- lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So not only is it a personal growth, it's about the impact we have for those around us. It's about living our fullest potential in Christ and then seeing what happens about that. And it's called a public witness. It's about how we engage with people. It's about what people notice about us. It's not about us being, oh, well, that person's a wonderful gift to us. It's about what we're doing for the kingdom of God. In Matthew 13, 15, we're called into the world. And when we're called into the world, we've got no choice. Every time you walk out the door of this church, you walk out the door of your house, you're called into the world. And you're in, in, you in, interact with people all the time. And when we interact with people all the time, what do they see? Well, do they see salt? And salt, in this re- instance, is used to permeate and retard the world's moral and ethical decay. That's what we're called to do. When we participate in life in this world as believers in Jesus, we're there to permeate. We're there to... (laughs) I've got another thing written down I'm going to share. We retard its moral and ethical decline. Interesting word, isn't it? You ever thought of yourself an anti-retardant? You spray it on, and off it goes. And one of the authors in one of the commentaries said it's about stopping society becoming rancid. He just paints up, you ever seen, you ever come across rancid meat? It's just not very nice. Um, you've got to agree our world's becoming like that. So we're called as the part of the vine, we're called as light, we're called as salt to glorify God through the way we participate in this world, to offer the world hope. Everywhere we go and shine, everywhere we go and serve, everywhere we go and participate is a mission. It's missional. We're a missional church. We're not a fat and faithful church. We're a missional church. And where we go, let people know about Jesus. And it doesn't have to be the very words, hey, have you heard about Jesus, my Lord and Savior? No, it just has to be how you engage in people with that authenticity about who we are and who we represent. It's about what God is saying through us, not about what we are. And Jesus was saying these words in the Sermon on the Mount, he was saying that we must, re- we must re- maintain our role. And that's what it talks about when the salt loses its saltiness. It's about retaining the role or being seen useless and rejected. 
So if you just stay in church and don't do anything and don't participate outside of church, what you're actually saying is, well, I'm the useless salt. It's a bit hard to take sometimes, isn't it? But that's what it means. It means that in the, w- the world will see the church, and I use that word you know, in inverted commas, the church as useless and rejected because we don't bring the salt into communities. We don't bring in places to serve. We don't take those opportunities up that God presents for us. I think well, Jesus goes on to talk about the light. He talks about illumination. And in why he spoke about it in these terms, he's actually quoting from Isaiah. And Isaiah talks about Jacob and talks about Israel. Isaiah 49, it says these words in verse 6. He says, it is too s- it's small a thing. It is too small a thing to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring those of Israel I have kept. It's too small to do that. God's picture is bigger than that. This is how big God's picture is. I will make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. Jesus spoke those words into the life. God sp- sorry, spoke those, lo- those words into the life of the Israelites and saying, I'm giving you the light and Jesus is part of that light and he's passing it on. Have you ever thought of the terms like that? God's picture is so big that he wants us to be in that servant role. He wants us to be disciples. It's about a way of life that we, ch- that we embrace, that we be part of. All this is for your benefit, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, so that grace is reached more and more. And this is what happens. More people, and the more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow for God. When we participate in things, when we are trimmed down and when we're, we're, p- we're potential about what we do, what happens is that people start to see God. People start to see God where you walk. I wonder if that's your story today. I wonder if that could be your testimony. But yes, I understand that. It's happened to me a few times. People have said things to me about that and I can't believe it's actually me that's doing it. I can't believe that God is using me that way. You see, it's really about being present, not pompous. <laughs> it's about being there for people, not being a doormat, but being there for people, but not being there with an air of superiority. Jesus said these words on the, uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, and he was imploring, to the dis- imploring the disciples, you need to be like this. And the reason is, is to glorify my Father in heaven. Sometimes we don't understand we're part of the big, big picture. <laughs> Sometimes we miss out on that because we become so entrenched in our own situation. And that's understandable. That's part of life. It's part of our humanity. But we have an opportunity to, re- to repent from that, to actually have an opportunity to turn from that, to say, Lord, I need to get right with you because I want to fulfill the purpose you have for me. Trim me, prune me, do whatever you do. Help me to be the salt and the light. But the main thing is that we need to strive to glorify God. When we bring glory to God, that is our sole purpose. I don't know if you thought about that. Every time you go through the Macca's drive-thru and they get the order wrong, how do you react? When you drive all the way to Bunnings at Plainhurst and they haven't got what you need, how do you react? I don't know, I've never done that yet. There's always something in Bunnings I need. It's about being purposeful. And when we're being purposeful, it brings us into the kingdom even closer. It's that special relationship we have. Jesus said to the disciples, while you're going, make disciples, baptize them. While you're involved in ministry, when you're in a missional church, which we're called to be, be participative in it. Take these words I'm giving you. While you are going, participate. Worship team, if you'd like to come up, we're going to close in a moment. I want you to remember though, please, that bearing fruit is growing your personal relationship with God. When you allow God to work in your life, he does that for a specific purpose. That's to bring us closer to him. We're in a servant role in our community. It's about changing society, which brings glory to God. And if we're going to participate in that, 
and he strive to glorify God. That's what it's about. I was going to put this at the title. I thought that'll give it away. But I want you to think about that and maybe where you've seen those words before. If we say those words out loud, strive to glorify God, then what does that mean? It means growing in God. It means giving all acknowledgement to him. We're going to, our last song we're going to sing is Waymaker. Is it still Waymaker, do you think? Okay. <laughs> Allowing for the spirit to move there. We decided Waymaker before the service, but um, it could have been something else. There's a word in the song that says you're always working. God is always working. He is the, he is the vine and God is the, is the gardener. He's always trimming and pruning. He's always bringing us closer to him. He's using the means that he has. There's a message for the church today is not to remain static but actually to be on the move. And as we're singing this song today and closing it down, I'm going to ask you the challenge again. If you need to do business with God today, if you need to pray, you need to just get it out there and say, Lord, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I've been missing out on this. Can I challenge you to participate in that? Don't go home today unless you've done business with God. If you're affirmed in your heart, that's awesome. Praise God. But if you need to do something about it, if the Spirit's prompting you now, please don't just shrug it off. Because God wants to do a work in you. He wants you to grow in you. He wants you to bear fruit and come close to Him. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that when Jesus was intimate with His disciples, when He was speaking in terms like He was, uh, the, the vine and the branches, the, the salt and the light, Lord, His intentionality, His purposeful intentionality was, Lord, to bring us closer to you and to glorify you. Lord, us to show that you are the God of the heaven and earth, of the universe. Father, you've given us a role to play in that, each of us in our own journey with you. And I pray today, Lord, pour your spirit on this church. Father, take away the, the shackles that bind. Father, give us freedom. Give people freedom, Lord, to celebrate and worship you and to be your disciples, Father, to walk into the community with the light that comes only from you. Lord, I pray your spirit falls upon us that the things that are hindering us, Lord, the sin in our life will be destroyed and taken away when we confess them before you. Lord, I pray, Father, for the spirit to fall upon our church to enlighten us, to be, give us revelation. That we might be able to reveal those truths to those around us. And spirit, I pray you'll fall upon our church. For each person in this church today, Lord, I pray not only the ones that are here, the ones that are home, the ones that are sick, the ones that are in homes, the ones that are on holidays, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will fall upon them. And Lord, encourage them that throughout this week and throughout this next time, Father, into the future, Lord, they will go in your strength. Lord, they will do business with you. Lord, they'll be freed in you, Jesus. Lord, that is what you promised. It said you will be with us to the end of the age. Your locker room speech, Lord, just fired up the disciples to go and do what they needed to do. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, fire us up for you. Lord, let us glorify you in your